we believe, uh, you know, the science is clear. Uh, global citizens, we, as, as global citizens, we need to decarbonize and move in that direction. Um, it, it's a big challenge, as we heard, you know, 2050 is, a, you know, it's a date, uh, but it, it's out there and we need to work towards it, just like uh, the Rear Admiral said, you know, we, we got to take, take on the challenge and make the steps to move forward. So when I, when I look at that, um, I was thinking about it, there's really, you know, that we have two options. We can, uh, the one option is we could just say, you know what, we're going to go back to the colonial times, we're going to be frontiersmen, we're going to live off the land. Um, that looks great when you watch Yellowstone, you know, it looks really nice out there in Wyoming and, you know, riding horses and, and going back and living off the land and raising cattle. But in reality, I think that genie's out of the bottle. I mean, we all know we're not, we're not going back to that. I mean, some people still retire and try to go back to that, but the mass majority of us are not going to go back to that. So um, the onus then really switches over to how can we, how can we overall reduce our footprint, right? I mean, it starts with everything. I mean, everything we consume to everything we do. Um, it's just a conscious effort when we wake up every day. What can we do to contribute to reducing the footprint? That being said, you know, I think the, uh, the waste stream, uh, LNG is a key point of, uh, you know, making an innovative solution that's a real solution that we can deliver in the near term. Uh, it's going to take cultural change, and it's also going to take a lot of industry partnerships and, and collaboration to move this forward. Uh, the, the points I'd like, the three points I'd like you to take away from what I talked about today is, you know, LNG is a safe and, and reliable and efficient marine uh, fuel. Uh, there, there is industry uh, uh, comments out there, as mentioned earlier, about the, you know, the incident in the 70s from the train. Uh, but I can tell you, you know, safety and reliability of this uh, as a marine fuel is, is moving forward, and it has been a marine fuel for over 50 years in the industry. So as Crowley, you know, we have an ambition to be the most sustainable and innovative maritime logistics provider in the Americas by 2025. What does that mean? Well, it means that we're going to be setting really bold targets and try to achieve them and, and move in that direction. Uh, so it's really changing our economic model. You can't just be a return on investment uh, from a capital investment, return on investment going forward. You're going to have to add a, a sustainability equation to your, to your economic model going forward. Um, so one of the things, uh, you know, is important. This is a marathon. It's, it's not a sprint. We're, we're not going to do this overnight. Uh, we've been, as mentioned earlier, we've been doing this for about 10 years to move it to a marine fuel, as a viable marine fuel. Uh, you know, the Chinese, to, to looking back on some of the history, you know, the Chinese had been using coal and natural gas as many as 2,000 years ago, uh, which, you know, it really uh, it, it tells you how long it takes to change the supply chain. So, you know, and coal became economically uh, produced in the United States in the 1700s, excuse me. Uh, and, it's, and then oil wells were drilled in the 1800s, hydrogen fuel cell in the 1800s, solar power was in the 1800s. So, I mean, a lot of these things have been out there and been available, but the fact of the matter is, you know, uh, converting them to be a, a deliverable marine fuel uh, in a marine solution uh, is, is not really practical in the near term. So I think that's a, that's a key point. And then the first electric car, that just came out, the production of the electric car came out in 2020. Uh, so, it, and as we see, that's moving forward, but it's gonna take a long time to displace all the, the gas burning cars that are out there in the industry. These are just examples of solutions that are moving uh, in, a, in a more economic, cleaner footprint. But for marine fuel, I think, you know, our view is, you know, we've been over 200 years with coal and oil as a marine fuel. So now it's our time to transition that to LNG as the next uh, cleaner fuel and give us a, a, a roadmap to be a, have a cleaner footprint uh, for the marine solutions. Because you can imagine, we're, we're seeing vessels being built today that are LNG powered, but it's only a fraction of the overall marine uh, market from a fuel distribution and, and, it's, and, it's, and it's really on the large scale vessels that we're seeing that. And, and the reason that coal and oil have been, you know, the, the mainstay is they're available. You can deliver them to the market and they can be stored reasonably cheap and, and delivered in, uh, in multiple locations. So that supply chain was built over hundreds of years uh, to make it a viable option. So as mentioned a little bit, the LNG started almost uh, in the 60s as a bulk transport, uh, but it never really took on as a marine fuel until about 10 years ago as, a, as an industry. So I think, you know, as an industry, we hold ourselves to high standard. And I think that's the key to making this the next marine fuel uh, of the future. 
and then moving it into the smaller scale vessels uh, where it's a sustainable solution for those vessels. Um, and as mentioned here, you can see a picture of a bunkering vessel uh, over in Europe. Uh, so this is actually coming to market, uh, which is a, it was a great sign for the market. Uh, there's been, been going on for uh, uh, almost uh, five years now, the LNG being built as a marine fuel. The marine en engine suppliers, another stakeholder in this, are, are really advancing how they're going to build and develop the next generation of the multi-fuel combustion engines. And then the other thing with the LNG is kind of it's going to allow us to transition and meet some of the EEXI standards that are coming forward as regulation. So as mentioned earlier, a lot of times we change because regulation tells us we've got to change. For instance, we had to change to low sulfur in the United States, and then we switched over from HFO to, to diesel. It was a big change, it was a big cost change, but those are the things that are coming forward. And now we have the international IMO standards that we're going to have to meet with the EEXI. Um, I think uh, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, it's a big uh, initiative for Crowley, as you can imagine, on all of our vessels to do the baseline assessment and then to move in a direction that, that will work for us uh, to meet those, those coming guidelines. So that being said, Crowley's made significant investment in LNG. Uh, as you know, we've invested in our ships. We're now investing in uh, uh, other facilities and then now a, a bunker vessel. So, Leveraging the bunker experience uh, that we've had, we're, we're using that to leverage on how we advance and be uh, kind of an industry leader with the technology and the safety of making this a true viable solution to move forward. Uh, the, as a company operates ships by diesel, we started designing LNG powered vessels almost uh, eight years ago is when we started the uh, endeavor for our container ships. Um, and then and since then, we've also entered into an ISO container vessel or container uh, transport to Puerto Rico to supply uh, microgrids and to industrial customers via LNG in, in the Puerto Rico region. But along the lines, one of the key things that is a, a partnership is the regula regulations to comply and to uh, meet the standards that are gonna be required uh, from a technical standpoint and from a classification and a regulation standpoint. So it's a, it's a key thing that's gonna uh, drive this is we need to be working as partners, industry partners, uh, the government regulations, uh, and then also our technology partners to advance these to make sure that we have uh, not only safe and reliable, but economic solutions that will meet the market demands. In this slide, I'm just showing a little bit about our small scale LNG uh, direction that we're taking. So what we've done, uh, we've invested in a facility down in Puerto Rico. It's a truck loading facility, similar to the ones you, you may have seen up here at the uh, tour in Jacksonville. Uh, so the, the, the goal here is to also offer a CO2 emissions uh, reduction plan for the uh, Americas and Central uh, America regions. And what we do there is we take these uh, LNG tanks to uh, industrial customers today but also in the future, uh, small scale uh, megawatt uh, plants that will be installed throughout Central America and the Caribbean. And the main reason is, to, there's a few key drivers here obviously, is the cost of electricity in the Caribbean basin in Central America is very high, and they're still using HFO and uh, diesel fuel in, in some regions uh, to, to uh, generate their electricity for their, for their main grid customers. Um, the, uh, this truck loading facility will be able to load 24 trucks a day uh, with expansion up to 48 trucks a day. So it's, uh, it's being commissioned as we speak uh, and will be up and running by the end of the year. Uh, this, is, this is really a, a game changer. As, and Puerto Rico uh, saw this and there's two other key points to this. The resiliency that you see with uh, these type of systems of microgrids. Uh, Puerto Rico lost power for five to six months in some regions uh, of the island. So if they can build these microgrids uh, in industrial areas or in large um, residential complexes, they'll have a backup plan when the, when the main grid or the main power lines go down. So uh, we see this as a huge uh, advantage to, to move forward to more resilient uh, power sources within the Caribbean and Central America. Uh, they have uh, microgrids in the United States for industrial customers today, but uh, the grid here in the United States is a lot more efficient uh, than we see in the, in the these other regions. So, you know, Crowley's taken some bold actions uh, in this arena. Uh, it took, you know, and, and even our industry trade lane competitor uh, has done the same thing. Uh, it takes uh, heavy capital investment. Uh, it's a 10 year life cycle from, from a project drawing plan to probably having your plan in action and operational. So it has been about 10 years. 
it's close to $500 million in investment to make this transition just in one trade lane. Uh, so you can imagine, to try and expand it to where this is actually a true uh, supply chain for LNG in, in North America, it's gonna take a lot more investment to make it really available to, to all the uh, vessel assets that we can convert into LNG powered. Another crit critical investment is our supply partners. You know, you know we, we're just talking about our vessels on the water. Our supply par partners have had invested uh, hundreds of millions of dollars to, to create a solution to, be, to have the supply at the waterfront. Um, as mentioned earlier, you know, getting the pipelines approved is one thing, but then you got to get the, once you get the pipeline to near water, then you still got to build a liquefaction plant. So there's a lot of, a lot of capital investment by a lot of partners to make this a viable solution. Uh, but the good news is it, it can, it can happen. We know it can happen and, and the technology exists. Uh, so some of the things that, uh, metrics that we've uh, tracked on this. Uh, since 2018, we've re re reduced the uh, uh, metric tons of uh, CO2 emissions by 64,000 uh, metric tons. And then uh, that's just on our Puerto Rico trade line. The other one is with our ISO distribution system. We have done about the same reduction in CO2 emissions with our customers that are taking LNG as a uh, microgrid fuel source. Uh, last but not least in this area, we're working currently uh, to put uh, renewable LNG into the system, uh, which will be uh, potentially a, a, a supplement to our fuel for our ships. And then and in Puerto Rico, we also signed up for a renewable LNG supply from a waste uh, facility, from one of the garbage facilities on the east end of the island. So they're, they're in the process of developing a CO2 and a uh, um, LNG from renewable gases from the, uh, the waste landfill. So these are some of the ideas that uh, we see going forward uh, to make LNG a, a, a viable fuel supply. Uh, but it's going to be, for these things to happen and move forward, it's going to take the partnerships that we talked about. Uh, companies to invest hundreds of millions of dollars have to have a, uh, have a stable government capital structure. We've got to have supporting regulatory environment. And in, in addition to that, we need to have a good, stable corporate tax because these are long-term investments. These are 20-year, 25-year investments at least uh, on the infrastructure side. So we can't, can't have the rules be changing uh, on an administration level uh, every four years. So we need to have stable, long-term uh, capital structure in order for companies to make these investments in, in large capital facilities. So that being said, there's still challenges. Uh, as you've heard earlier this, uh, today and probably uh, yesterday, when, uh, there's a lot of challenges to be done. Uh, as I'll, to transition over, it, a lot of capital investment. Uh, demand by customers is, uh, is moving up. Uh, we hear about it from, uh, um, from a bid cycle and from customer requests, like what are, what are we doing to reduce the carbon footprint? So it is, it, it is coming down the, the uh, chain to uh, be a driver from the customers, which is, a, which is a nice change to see because in the past, a lot, of, a lot of parts of the market in the transportation area, we were just being asked, well, what's your price for moving a container from here to there or moving a vessel from here to there? But they're, they're actually asking the question now, what are we doing to reduce our carbon footprint? Uh, we were in a meeting yesterday with uh, Ecuador on the offshore wind side uh, and that was one of the key things. Two things they brought up was safety and what are you doing to reduce your carbon footprint and how are you going to make things cleaner? Uh, so it's good to see that the customers are asking those questions up front and they're actually putting that into their value decision when they're making decisions. So that is a nice change and that's going to help us move this industry forward. Um, and then uh, this year is just a rendering of the bunker bars that we're building for uh, Savannah, which was announced recently uh, with our partner Shell and Finn Conterry. Uh, to Finn Kater will be the uh, builder of the vessel and then Shell uh, chartering it for their, their market development in the, uh, in the Savannah, in the southeast region. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, this is going to require a lot of bold infrastructure investment. New vessels, new assets, uh, and, and I think new platforms for vessels in, in the U.S. North American market. So we, we're going to have to change and look at how can we innovate and create the next uh, vessel of the uh, coastwise vessel for the United States that can be a, a clean burning fuel. We're, we're looking at it right now on the SOVs for the offshore wind, uh, but that being said, there's still a lot of other vessels in the market and coastwise transportation that can uh, be transferred over to the LNG solution. 
There's a fair amount of tankers, the newer generation tankers that are working in the U.S. Uh, they are pre-fitted to be converted over to LNG uh, in the future when, when the economics uh, make it uh, viable and when there's a supply chain for them to get fuel where they're trading. Um, and then the other key things we've seen, obviously in the big international industry, we're seeing the cruise ships started driving this in the southeast region uh, pre-COVID. Uh, they took a setback, obviously, with the demand for the cruise ship industry in the last few years. Uh, but that being said, they're still uh, going forward delivering these vessels. They're, they're slightly delayed in delivery, but they are coming to the market. But as that was happening, uh, the container ship customers, the tankers, and the car carriers are also advancing plans to move LNG as their main fuel source. Uh, so at the same time, we have to run in parallel to build a uh, infrastructure that will support these uh, vessels calling on North America for uh, fuel supply. Uh, another key thing that we uh, picture in this uh, slide here, you can see, is uh, we've endeavored on an electric, all-electric tug. Uh, this, is a, this is a perfect example of where we need the uh, partnership with private and public. Uh, this, this project wouldn't have been viable if we didn't have some uh, grant funding from the government. Uh, as you know, California is a, a key driver in the emission standards. They, they, they are, uh, I would say, leading uh, the industry, obviously, in North America. They may be leading the... Uh, the regulation in the world at this point in time, but I think it's catching up on a worldwide scale. But this particular project was uh, viable because we did a, a public partner relationship to uh, bring an ele all electric tug with a shore side battery charging station uh, to the market. So that'll be coming out uh, in 2023 is the uh, plan for that vessel to be in the water in uh, California. Last but not least, I just want to, you know, the partnerships, as mentioned earlier this morning, was kicked off, uh, was, you know, it, this is going to take a lot of partnerships to move this forward. Uh, it can't be just individual companies trying to advance one deal. It's a, it's a whole supply chain. It took us 200 years to build the supply chain we have today for the oil to get to vessels. Uh, it's going to, hopefully it's not going to take us 200 years to build this supply chain. But we need to start now, and we need to make the transition to uh, LNG as economical, viable as we can, all the way down to the to the workboats of the industry. Uh, a big big area that we didn't even talk about yet, or may have talked about yesterday, but the, the inland tug and barge industry is a huge fuel uh, user, and to, to bring it to that market would be also a key uh, key industry transition. And the good news is the gas is available along the Mississippi River, so that's the. Uh, that is the good news, is the, the gas source is, is there, it's just a matter of making it uh, viable on the inland, inland waterways. So in, in closing, I guess the, uh, the things, bringing back the main points, LNG is safe and it's reliable. Uh, you know, it's a, we've been you know, moving it in, uh, in our Conroe ships, uh, they've been moving it on the bulk transport for over 50 years as a uh, bulk transport uh, uh, fuel. And there's been very low incident rate with the uh, with the LNG, so I think that's uh, that's key. We we've been moving it in ISO containers, uh, and it's it's just a really matter of having a high quality assurance program, uh, an inspection program, and making sure you're you're training and qualifying the operators. And and that's the the one thing I'd like to not forget about is the the people that that work in this industry. We're going to have to spend the money to train and develop the, the uh, technicians that are going to work uh, in the field and make sure that we are uh, holding ourselves accountable to the standards and the safety requirements in the field. Uh, we, we've learned a lot of lessons in our ISO distribution uh, uh, business because you're relying on sometimes third-party truckers. So you got to spend the money as an operator to train your truckers to understand what the safety and, and, the, and the control mechanisms are on these uh, tanks. And it's the same thing you're gonna have to do on vessels. Uh, so there's gonna be a, a big push. Uh, you know, it's one thing to invest in assets, but we're gonna have to invest in people. Uh, that, that's, that's the only way this is gonna move forward in a safe and reliable manner. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I don't think we're going back to the frontier in, in the farming and riding horses. So uh, we need to work as partners in this and uh, you know, it, it's going to it's going to help us really move our near-term agenda to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, I, I believe that's that's true. I think LNG is is the transition fuel to other fuels, but there's a huge gap. Uh, as, as Dina mentioned, there's we're not going to just LNG is not even going to fill the gap. I mean, there's so much uh, oil that we have to displace over the years uh, that we need to build a really strong supply chain to be able to do that. Um, 
No, that's uh, the, the uh, remarks I wanted to start with, and then I'd like to just open up, open it up to the floor for questions, comments. What do you think is holding back uh, the uh, Jones Act tanker operators with the 18 LNG ready tankers currently in service from converting to LNG? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think I think we're holding ourselves back. Is uh, you know we we haven't. As I mentioned earlier, the, the economic model, we're just looking at, you know, voyage costs, right? So if you, you're just doing a short-term voyage cost, um, when diesel is at a certain uh, level, you can say that it's not, we're not going to get a payback for, I don't know, seven years, five years, depending on what the conversion cost. Fortunately, the conversion cost is coming down from when I, when I first started in the uh, tanker side of the industry. Uh, but I think the key is we got to we got to make the, the, we got to bring in sustainability and, and carbon reduction into the equation when we're making these these decisions. I think that's what's holding us back. We're not we're not looking at the carbon reduction uh, when we're making decisions today. Because I would tell you that the last time I looked at it, it was a five to six year payback on conversion, as long as you had supply in where you were where your route was. So I think the other key is obviously you got to have supply. Uh, along the uh, along the uh, routes, you know the Puerto Rico trade for our, our ships works perfect. They they come back and forth. Cruise ships come back and forth to the same place. Tankers do uh, go to multiple locations, so they got to have a better supply chain. I, one of the really important parts parts of uh, the development of LNG in the future is going to be the use of bio. And you were mentioning uh, you had a project going to Puerto Rico in the waste stream. I mean, how, how do you see that developing? In the lower 48, if you will. Well, I, th I think it takes uh, uh, so again. It takes the people to have a, a vision and an investment plan. Uh, the folks in Puerto, you can imagine in Puerto Rico, they've been. Uh, I think uh, Arturo, how long have they been working down there on that project? Yeah. Yeah. So two, they've been working on this project for two or three years, and it was interesting. I went to the site, and the. Uh, the, the site had been, had drilled uh, the, the wells in the, in the landfill, and they've been there for seven years. So they had they had been so it's a, it's one of the well it's the only uh, EPA compliant uh, landfill in Puerto Rico. So they they uh, process the, the liquids and they process the gas. But what they were doing with the gas is they've been flaring the gas for seven years through a big flare. So I mean it was it just it was just unbelievable. You, you think about the waste of energy that was going on for seven years there. So what it takes is, is uh, 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 thought leaders to go down there and say, how, well, how can we harness this energy and convert it into other sources? So, for instance, on that particular site, they're going to they're going to produce 100 uh, percent, or at least they predict they're going to produce 100 percent of the CO2 required for the industry on the island. Uh, so that, that's a huge thing, and they're going to be producing four to five uh, LNG tanks a day, which is you know what. To, 30, 40,000 gallons of, of LNG per day from that facility. So it takes it takes thought leaders and, and people to invest. Uh, and obviously, and, and then at the end of the day, the customers have already come out of the woodwork to say, hey, we want, it, we want that uh, renewable LNG because they want it for their carbon credits. Matt, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Have a good time.